Um, in terms of how scrimshaw was made, um, it was a multi-step process. Um, first of all, uh, you acquired hopefully a tooth. That was always the best material to work with. Um, and again, teeth might be anywhere from five to 10 inches long. Um, in this close-up, you might be able to see uh, a sort of um, arc uh, going through the tooth about a third of the way uh, down from the point. So uh, that top third is probably the, uh, the part of the tooth that would have been above the gum line, and that larger portion of the tooth would have been uh, down below the gum. Um, you might be able to tell that the material is uh, quite ridged. Um, so the first thing um, a sailor wanted to do would be to take a jackknife and to start uh, scraping off those ridges. Your goal is to get a nice, uh, smooth, even surface. So you would work that with your um, jackknife. Um, then you would want to sand it down. That was often done uh, with a piece of shark skin. Um, and then you would follow that up um, with a good buffing using a chamois cloth or a um, heavy piece of flannel. So uh, if you gave it a good rub with that, um, you could get a lovely uh, shiny surface. So that was sort of uh, the first step, sort of preparing the tooth. Then you would go ahead and either uh, carve it or engrave on it. Um, if you were engraving, you might use um, the tip of a jackknife, you might use an awl, um, or in some cases, <clears throat> you might get a um, sail needle. <clears throat> so of course, every whaling ship would have someone who was in charge of making and repairing sails. Um, the uh, needles were probably three or four inches in length. Uh, you can see some examples. Um, although usually men would probably only get these um, to use during, during uh, to use for scrimshaw uh, if the tip had broken. So, but at any uh, rate, you would want uh, a metal object with a good point on it uh, to engrave your design. The final step would be to add color. So in most cases, uh, scrimshaw is um, uh, done in black. Um, this would usually be um, soot. Um, it might be um, tar from the pots that they uh, use to boil uh, the whale meat in. Um, in some cases, it might be ink or uh, either commercial ink or squid ink. Um, but you would uh, apply that to the surface that you'd engraved and then wipe the extra off and uh, that um, dye color would then be caught in the uh, engraving on the tooth and you'd be able to see the object. Um, in some cases, there are also pieces which are polychrome. That means simply that they use more than one color. Um, and dyes could um, come from any number of different sources. So you might have vegetable dyes, uh, you might use coffee or tea, um, again, you might use commercially available pigments. Um, you might use mineral pigments. Um, so a whole variety of, of possible sources. Um, th there seems to be um, debate in the field about whether tobacco juice was used to color scrimshaw. Um, I, I think that scholarship has probably went out of the side of, no, in fact, that's an old tale and uh, not true. So, um, but you will still hear people uh, debating that. So, um, so that's a little bit about uh, what it is, when it was made, how it was made. In terms of who made it, um, really everyone on a, on a ship uh, would do scrimshaw. Um, from the green hands, these would be uh, sailors who were setting off on their um, very first uh, whaling trip. Uh, all the way up to the officers and the mates and the captain. Um, so uh, pretty much uh, at all ranks, people made scrimshaw. Um, captains would very often encourage men to make scrimshaw um, because if there were no whales to be caught, it kept their minds and their hands busy and uh, men were less likely um, uh, to get into mischief or get into arguments. Um, so captains often saw it as um, something very useful for people to be doing. Um, in terms of uh, the way 
parts of whales would be distributed among the crew. Um, basically, uh, this was done pretty much by rank. So uh, if your captain happened to have just finished a lovely piece of scrimshaw and he was looking to start a new one, you knew that the very, the very finest tooth of the next thing you caught was going to the captain. And if you were at the very bottom of the pecking order, um, it, you might end up with uh, not tooth, but um, pan bone or some other type of bone from the whale. Um, in terms of uh, why people made scrimshaw, there were really two sort of driving forces. Um, one um, was the nature of the uh, whale trip to begin with, the whaling voyage. Um, it, uh, whaling voyages lasted from um, very often from three to four years, and during that time you might go weeks or perhaps even months uh, without seeing a whale. So during this time um, there was some routine maintenance to do aboard the ship, some menial tasks, but you would have long stretches of time where you had nothing to do. Um, in addition to this, uh, your ship might also be becalmed. Um, that is, uh, there's simply no wind and so the ship really isn't moving. Um, and sailors always talk about this with a certain amount of um, distress, um, that it's unnatural to be on the water and to be uh, essentially standing still. Um, a, 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 one captain wrote in his uh, log book uh, that his brain felt uh, fevered for want of work, um, that the, the monotony was so bad that um, it really uh, became almost disturbing to the men. Um, so scrimshaw was something that um, helped to occupy their hands and their minds um, during those long periods when there were no whales. The second um, real driver uh, in terms of people making scrimshaw um, was the fact that they were homesick. Um, for many uh, young men, especially green hands who again were just setting out on their first whaling voyage, um, if you were from a small New England town, you might very well be leaving behind everyone you knew for a period of three or four years. Um, so your, your parents, brothers and sisters, um, friends you'd known your entire life, you might be leaving all of those people behind and, and for an extended period of time. Uh, I think back on uh, 2020 and this first part of 2021, um, when uh, we all feel uh, so anxious to get back to a time when we can visit our loved ones. Um, today we do have the comfort of being able to pick up the phone and at least talk to them. And of course, um, during the 19th century, um, you really had nothing. You might be able to write a letter that might get back to your family. They might be able to write you a letter that maybe you would get in some port later on, um, but it was a bit of a tenuous proposition. Um, so uh, men were very often homesick. The other thing you would miss would be the comforts of home. So uh, take for example, food. Food on whaling ships really had a reputation for being atrocious. Um, of course, there would be very little fresh food of any kind. Um, even um, basics like flour, for example, might become uh, contaminated by insects. Um, one sailor writes in his journal about pieces of hard tack, that's kind of like a very hard biscuit, dried biscuit, moving across the table without any human aid because of the workings of the critters inside of it. Um, people talk about um, casks of water becoming slimy. Um, some of it's really, really disgusting. <laughs> and crews uh, did on occasion mutiny over the quality of the food. Um, so this was a serious issue. Um, the issue of quarters and personal space was quite difficult. Uh, the crew had their quarters in the very front part of the ship, which was sort of a triangular-shaped area, 
um, sometimes uh, known as the forecastle, uh, although usually pronounced folksle. Um, so in the folksle would be hammocks. Um, you might have a small trunk with a few personal items in it. Um, but the space was very small. It was dark, it was airless, um, and it was too small to fit all the men at once. So uh, people would sleep in shifts. Um, and it was probably unusual to ever sleep, you know, seven or eight hours in a row. You'd sleep a few hours here, get up, um, do some tasks aboard the ship, uh, sleep again a few hours later on. Um, so that was quite difficult. There, and there simply was no personal space. Um, another thing that was very difficult aboard a whaling ship was the smell. Apparently the smell of boiling whale meat is really, really bad. <laughs> Some people would talk about um, being able to tell that a whaling ship was coming into port before you could see it because the smell was so bad. Um, and of course that would work its way into your clothes, your skin, your hair. Um, certainly there'd be a point at which you would probably become somewhat inured to it, but, um, but certainly at the outset, um, that was uh, something that people uh, really found terribly unpleasant. So, um, so those, all those factors, um, not having much to do, feeling very homesick, wanting to divert yourself from all the miserable parts of being on a whaling ship for such an extended period of time. Um, all those things factored into making uh, Scrimshaw a very, very popular pastime. So in our next video, we're gonna talk uh, a little bit more about the two broad categories of Scrimshaw, and that's uh, functional or practical pieces and the decorative.